Okay. Um, today I'd like to start off with a quotation that was written by one of our fellow countrymen, uh, Jonathan Swift, who spent a lot of time around um, Lochry, Loch Gall, and um, he actually wrote that whoever could make two years of corn or two blades of grass to grow upon a spot of ground where only one grew before would deserve better of mankind and do more essential services to his country than the whole race of politicians put together. <laughs> And absolutely have to say that in Northern Ireland, where we're absolutely world-class at growing grass, we can definitely grow two blades of grass where one only grew before. And I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about our food journey, because in Northern Ireland, we're in a really fascinating food journey over the last five to 10 years. And I think we are really finding our place on the world stage. And I'd just like to take you back through how some of that has happened. About eight years ago, the industry had agreed that we needed a promotional strategy for Northern Ireland agri-food, something that put out a positive message locally to tourists, to locals and in international markets. And at that time, our whole food industry was worth about two and a half billion pounds. And what was fascinating back then was that we were already exporting more beef and more uh, milk than Scotland, but we didn't necessarily have a reputation for it. And approximately 20% of the beef on supermarket shelves in the UK at that time came from Northern Ireland. Um, but all of this was going completely unnoticed. Um, and at that time, we did an awful lot of independent research with the help of DARD and Invest NI. And it really confirmed that Northern Ireland's food industry was perceived as uh, troubled, underplayed and unknown. And unfortunately, Northern Ireland was per perceived as an inner city place um, with red brick houses rioting, and it wasn't the beautiful lush green region that, that we know and that we enjoy every day. But strangely enough, from my point of view, it was the multiple supermarkets who told us that when they came to Northern Ireland and put an English store layout into our local stores, and that was post-1994, they told us that they got it completely wrong. Despite being an island, um, and people perceive, therefore, that we have a big fish culture, they soon discovered that we are very much in love with our grass-fed beef. Um, and if anybody's travelled to America or had American visitors in, you'll know that they'll ask you frequently, is the beef grass-fed? Because they pay a premium for grass-fed uh, beef in the States. The supermarkets completely misunderstood our ethnic breads, our soda, treacle, potato, even potato apple, wheaten, vita, nutty crust. They didn't understand our sweet tooth and our desire for apple tarts. They hadn't heard about tray bakes. They didn't know about strong tea. Um, they told us you couldn't give PG tips away. They didn't understand what soup veg was, the uh, fresh soup veg, um, which contains soup celery in it. Um, they tried, I think, on a few occasions to take it to other regions, but most people thought it was just weeds. Um, they didn't understand our whole baking culture and the fact that uh, west of the band people still buy um, large quantities of potato to make potato bread and flour and baking ingredients. And of course they didn't understand potato crisps. Um, and um, <laughs> I once gave potato crisps to an American girl who went to the bathroom afterwards and brushed her teeth two times before she would go out and face the public, but she did enjoy them. Um, and what, what they did point us to, out to us, though, was we just didn't have an image for food. So they were saying, we have these great products in Northern Ireland, but how do we sell them over in Holborn? We can sell Wales, we can sell Scotland, we can sell Cornwall, we can sell Yorkshire. And what they actually said to us was, well, look, get your act together, Northern Ireland. You need, to, you need to sort this out. So back then, with support from Invest in I and Ard, we did a lot of research. And we started work on a television campaign that we ran about five years ago. Um, that was very interesting because we did a lot of research with local people about what they thought about food. And at that time, they were saying things to us like, look, EasyJet had just come to Northern Ireland. So they were starting to really enjoy the stag weekend or hen weekend culture or heading away to Prague for the weekend. And what they said was, look, we want to go and travel the world. We want to be globally connected people, but we want to come back and have strong tea and sort of bread and potato crisps. Um, and also, you know, we, we know our food culture's um, not about, you know, it's not like the Italian food culture, it's not about pride, because we're kind of an understated people. Um, but we do have a real food culture and we want to put it out there. 
So we came up with this concept around Northern Ireland, good food is in our nature, and people liked it because there's a wee bit of quirky Northern Irish humour in it. And it was based on the fact that um, it's reassuring that food grown in Northern Ireland comes just as nature intended. Um, we're lucky to have such rich soil, dependable rain, clear waters, and lush pasture land in Northern Ireland. And it's this wonderful combination that makes our apples so juicy, our fish so tasty, and our livestock so healthy. And this climate uh, is perfect for uh, locally produced food and drink that kind of win awards over the world. So our strap line was, we can be proud that Northern Ireland food is the real thing, pure and simple. Northern Ireland, good food is in our nature. So the industry worked together to um, translate this into a television campaign. And the proposition, what we tried to get across in that campaign was that most of our land is untainted, that it's natural, that our food producers, and you're going to hear from some of them later, have very high standards of animal husbandry and quality control. That in fact, in Northern Ireland, most food producers are our neighbours. I mean, you're really never more than five miles away from a farm. And that this all com combines to provide us with higher quality, fresher and tastier food and drink. And out of this, Food NI was born about five years ago. And we're a very small organisation. We're primarily industry funded, but our aim is, as Rosemary said, to enhance the reputation of food from Northern Ireland. And it was five brave men, five founder members, primarily food producers, who um, put their name to the Articles and Memorandum of Association to start the company. Because um, you may not appreciate it, but out outside of this room, generally the food industry is in competition with one another because one part of the food industry is, is supplying a product onto another. But they saw the bigger picture. They had a very strong drive that they wanted to do something about this problem. So Food and I was formed. And then a couple of years ago, we got responsibility for the Taste of Ulster message. And just to give you an idea, we started five years ago. We had a stand at Balmoral with just five producers on it. And I'll tell you a bit about how that's grown. We did two or three events. And last year, in 2012, we were involved in some way or another in almost 30 food events across Northern Ireland. And this year, we will be printing over 20,000 copies of the Taste of Ulster Guide. We've now become the first point of contact for food news. And there is a lot of it. Um, and we get a lot of contacts from journalists, both locally and from the GB. And we would have strong links into the um, independent media as well. We've recently started a quarterly food supplement with the Belfast Telegraph. And I think we've published now six editions. And we're absolutely delighted that uh, a member of ours, Flavour Magazine, has started its own food magazine. And Cathy's here in the audience today, and I'm sure she'll be keen to have a chat with you. Our website is now absolutely heaving with information. And if we're honest, we're actually ready for a revamp uh, because we need something that's going to be more mobile friendly. And we have 1,200 followers on Twitter. And um, it's been very interesting over the last few months to see the power of Twitter in relation to issues such as the debate over the continental market in front of the City Hall, whether it should be a local one, and also in relation to the current campaign about backing Belfast to try and encourage people back in uh, to the evening economy. So we have found that um, it's a, different, it's a different world, very different world to it was five years ago. Um, and there's all this social media and talk about food. 2012 was a really pivotal year for Northern Ireland food and tourism. And we were faced with the opportunity that we could use it to promote local food on an international stage. And we really grasped the opportunity with both hands. And we sampled, Irish food, sorry, sampled local food at the Irish Open. And we ran a, a food event at Flavours of the Foil. Um, we took the opportunity to align our message with the Our Time, Our Place, and we shortened Good Food is in Our Nature down, and we, called, we shortened it down to Our Food, So Good. And then we developed these messages, and our vision is that we would like to have some of these for every county. Um, but I, we found a great response to them. For example, at the Irish Open, the most popular one would have been lashed by our rain and bashed by our winds. At the Clipper Homecoming, um, we found that people responded really well to the messages around fished here, not shipped here, caught here, not brought here. And in fact, Clipper was just an amazing event. Um, it was so good that they ate us out of house and home. And despite what I said earlier about Northern Ireland not having a fish culture, uh, we found that whenever people were uh, given the opportunity to buy fish that had been cooked by a local chef, they took it. In fact, we were due to go on to eight o'clock at night and we sold out by four o'clock in the afternoon and the restaurateurs had to go back and, um, and buy more stock. 
And then, of course, um, the home audience responded really well to these messages as well. As I said earlier, we started our food pavilion at Balmoral five years ago with just five exhibitors. And by 2012, we had 50 local companies showcasing their products to both um, the public visiting and also to the retailers. And by that stage, we were getting a totally different response from the retailers. In fact, the same retailer came to us and said that they did a tour of Balmoral show and said that the food industry here was exciting. Because by then, the food industry had really changed. Um, a number of things that happened, I suppose, in the run-up to it. I mean, a few years ago, Dromona Cheese, their extra mature cheddar, won the great, um, the best cheese in the world award for extra mature cheddar. But 2011 and 2012 saw a real plethora of awards coming to Northern Ireland. So, really outstanding achievement in both 2012, sorry, 2011 and 2012. Northern Ireland gained the Supreme Champion Award in the Great Taste Awards for all of the UK and Ireland, and that means that they beat off 8,800 other products to come first in the UK and Ireland. And I think that's worth saying again. In the blind tasting, they beat off 8,800 other products to come first in the UK and Ireland. In 2011, McCartney's and Moira won for their corned beef. Um, not like any corned beef, but corned beef slow cooked and made from Silverside. And in 2012, Hannan Meats won for their guanciale which was made from local pork cheek. And I think Adrian's going to tell you a bit more about what they do with Hannans. And even more amazingly, two UK winners both came from the same village in Moira. And just about half a mile up the road the same year, David and Janet U. Pritchard won Supreme Gold in the Irish Food Awards for their tempted strawberry cider. And across over 40 companies in 2012, 190 gold stars were awarded for local produce. Um, and I think um, Ross is going to tell you a wee bit about some of that as well as well. For the first time, as Katie mentioned, we got um, Product of Geographic Indication Awards for our foodstuffs with the eels, the early potatoes, and Richard's going to tell us about them in a minute, and the Armagh Bramley apples. And also last year, stories started to emerge about local food heroes. And many untold stories that had been well, suppressed for a long time the first one I'd like to mention is the story of Sir Hans Sloan, and I know Maeve's here from Killy Chocolate Festival, which was an absolutely fantastic event, but very few people know that the person who invented milk chocolate came from Killy and he was a gentleman called Hans Sloan, and he went on to become, um, he was a great botanist, went on to become a physician to the king, found the British Museum, and give his name to both Sloan Square and Hans, Pl and Hans Place. I have to say, though, I think inventing chocolate was probably a wee bit better than all the rest of that. Um, and then we found out other stories. There was a book written about a man called John Clark, um, who was a very modest farmer from Ballantoy. He gained an international reputation as a successful potato breeder. And he actually bred 33 varieties of potatoes. And they say that nowadays it takes five years and 10 million pounds to breed one variety of potatoes. And he bred 33 on his own. In fact, he actually bred the um, parent of Maris Piper, which is something that we all eat today. And it was wonderful to see these things coming along and being celebrated. In true North Antrim style, they'd famously said about John Clark before, he never bred a, he never bred a plate of anything worth eating, but he, didn't, he, did, he did a lot more than that. You know, he, he made such a huge contribution to agriculture. And 2012 was full of food celebrations, and we can really see there's a food calendar starting to emerge in Northern Ireland. Early on in the year with the launch of the Titanic Centre, we went out around Belfast and demonstrated second and third class menus from Titanic. We found that um, visitors were absolutely fascinated by that, particularly to know what third class people ate uh, on the Titanic. We were involved with um, Glenarm at the Dalriada Festival, and Adrian will say more about that. Larne had an oyster festival. Now, you may not know it, but Larne is actually um, quite a significant exporter now of oysters. As I mentioned, Killy Lay had its Hans Sloan Chocolate Festival, Bush Mills had a Salmon and Whiskey Festival, and there was a Belfast Restaurant Week. And by that stage, the food industry was now worth in excess of four billion pounds. So you can see how over those four and five years, there'd been a real growth and a real change. And looking forward to 2013, lots of those local festivals are going to be repeated, but there's two things that I'd like to draw your attention to. The first is um, huge opportunities in relation to 
Derry, London, Derry City of Culture, and maybe even bigger opportunities in relation to the FLA, which comes to Northern Ireland for the first time. And then in August, the 2013 World Police and Fire Games, which are the third largest games in the world. Just to give you an idea, they're three times bigger than the Paralympics in terms of competitors. They're expecting 12,000 athletes to bring in another 18,000 friends and family. And um, their catchphrase is the friendliest games. And we believe food is part of friendship. So we've we have signed up um, a heads of agreement with the police and fire games to provide the local food at the events. And we've had some interesting expressions. I was saying to you, we're trying to develop this um, messaging by region. And we had a very bright spark who said the other day, Northern Ireland dinners make you winners. But uh, I'm not so sure. And just to finish off, because I want to um, hear from the food heroes, I mean, our future hero is really, or, sorry, our future vision is really to have um, a year-long festival of food in Northern Ireland. We can already see it starting to happen. Um, Balmoral this year moves to uh, the maze. We've going to, we're going to have over 60 producers at Balmoral Park. And as Rosemary said, fantastic opportunity for local chefs to showcase local produce. There's also uh, plans for a Cumber Potato Festival in June. But as you can see, and from what I've said earlier, that whole uh, food culture in Northern Ireland, the, the season's really extending from just a few minutes, um, sorry, from just a few months to, um, to nearly all of the year. So our vision would be maybe for 2016 to have a festival in food in Northern Ireland, maybe to have it in restaurants, maybe to have it in retail, um, we're not sure. It's a vision of ours, and um, I suppose uh, it may be a dream, but we believe that where there is no vision, the people perish, so we have to have a vision. So I'd really now like to just introduce Ross Thompson, um, another famous uh, Northern Ireland author, um, said that you can never have a cup of tea or a book long enough to satisfy me, and that was C.S. Lewis. So maybe, Ross, you could come up and tell us a bit about uh, Thompson's family teas. Thank you. Here we go. Can everyone hear me okay? Is that okay? Good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. My name's uh, Ross Thompson uh, of Punjana Limited, and uh, I'd like, if I may, to tell you a little bit about our company and our family tradition with tea over the last 117 years. Um, it all dates back to 1896, where uh, when our, our grandfather, Robert Thompson, that's him on the top there, that's a photo photograph, incidentally, taken on his wedding day, I don't think everything must have gone just to plan, but <laughs> I think in those days it wasn't the done thing, to be fair, to smile in photographs. But the tea industry then was very different. The, there were no brands whatsoever. It was all thousands of small grocers in Northern Ireland selling tea chests, huge whole leaf grade tea chests of tea with fancy names like Hattie Maher and Doomer de Lung. And it was my grandfather's company that it was their job to provide these tea chests and deliver them to their shops where they would spoon out this lovely, glorious loose leaf tea into little quarter pound packets and fold over the packet. Um, uh, and that's how the tea business was in Northern Ireland. Things changed uh, for the second generation. Uh, James Thompson, uh, my father, and Tony Thompson, my uncle, um, who ran the business and continued my grandfather's good work uh, right up into the 70s. I'm the third generation, uh, that's myself and my cousin David Thompson. I, I know what you're thinking, what's my younger brother doing in that photograph instead of me? But this, <laughs> this was taken a few years ago when my hair colour was slightly different. It's been a difficult ten years. But, <laughs> but, but back, to, um, back, to, sorry, back to the second generation, uh, James and Tony Thompson. Things changed in the 1950s, the whole tea industry changed. Brands came in from England. The brands you know, the Tetley, the PG, Typhoo, um, Lions Green Label, a proper cup of tea. Those people that might be as old as me might remember that's the oldest commercial I remember. So they had a challenge, what to do with all these, uh, with the changing face of the, of the tea world. So they decided 
to invent a brand of their own. And it actually was during a shopping uh, trip to Cumber that my, when my mother and father were, were, were there that my father noticed a little, uh, just on the top of this Gillespie statue, which is still there, uh, a little inscription that said the word Punjab. And he thought, yes, yeah, something that sounded Indian but not a place name. So it was my mother that came up with this fictitious name, Panjana. Strange, isn't it, how brand names are born? So this is one of the, this is the, the oldest surviving pack. This was in uh, 1960. And it's rather a glorious design, isn't it? Quite trendy for a way back then. And this is, this is uh, kept in, in good care and, and prized by ourselves back in the office. Loose tea was 100% of the market in those days. And pick Panjana tea in the first night of Ulster television helped to make our little brand famous. An awful lot of conviction back then when we sold very little, but my father and uncle really believed in this brand and were prepared to get behind it. On my first day's work, um, I wasn't trusted, obviously, to come into the office, so I was sent to India for three months. And um, I have to say that it's the most fascinating three months of my life. Um, I don't want you to think that I have a very boring life. It just really was fascinating. And when, when you first see a tea garden, this was my first tea garden, it's called Berenga Julie. They're all fancy names. This one's called Berenga Julie. We still buy this tea to this day. It's a wonderful garden. And when you look out to two and a half to 3,000 acres of, it's like a billiard table. It's so flat and the tea bushes are so tightly packed together, it's hard to see where one starts and another one ends to, and to squeeze in between them. But it's a sea of green. And this young growth on top of the tea bush takes just seven to 10 days to grow. Isn't that amazing? Every seven to 10 days, there's a new crop effectively, two leaves and a bud. And this is hand-picked every seven to 10 days. So it's not necessary for myself and David to stand out there watching it grow. We're mostly back here in Belfast waiting for the samples to be airmailed to us. If you weren't a tea drinker and you saw a tea garden, these tea these trees, by the way, aren't randomly there. They're there to keep their shade trees, to keep the midday sun from scorching the leaves. But if you saw those sea of green, it occurs to you how natural and how pure tea is. And if you weren't a tea, tea drinker, I believe you'd start. Um, that's the Sam. That's almost sea level. We also buy an awful lot of Kenyan teas. This is a garden called Tinderet, but it's 7,000 feet above sea level, sea level. Equally gorgeous. This is just a small fraction of tinderet. What you see there, all the bright green areas are, are tea, tea bush, and that's about a sixth of this garden. I'm going to tell you just quickly how to make tea, just to prove to you how pure and how simple it is. It's only, tea is only as good as the garden you buy the leaves from, the Berenga Julies, the tinderets, because it's to do with soil, altitude, and climate. So but it's quite simple to produce. You pick, or the word is actually pluck, tea leaves and carry them or bring them to these withering troughs. They're almost the length of this room and the leaves are piled 10 inches deep. They smell gorgeous. They don't smell on the tea bush, the tea leaves intact, but when you break, when you start to, these leaves are losing water, they're withering. You can see they're going floppy. This is a slow bit, it takes 12 hours. It smells divine. If you were to smell those leaves, you would understand why tea will always be in existence. 12 hours, there's a slow bit, the withering. And then these leaves are broken up and cut, into, cut up into all different particle sizes. And this, this bed, about six inches of these cut leaves, are transported very slowly for 50 minutes and they ferment, just like an apple would if you bite into an apple and left it down. And they turn from this color to this color in 50 minutes. And then very quickly, that's fermented tea, very quickly it's transported into these dryers, the big ovens. And there's an oven somewhere up here where there's a conveyor. And that big oven is about half the size of this room. And air jets push the tea up into midair. The, air, the tea, the wet green tea leaves hover in midair until it gets to the end five, five minutes later and it's made black tea. It's like toasted tea leaves and that's tea. And that's we, we don't wet it hopefully, until you pour boiling water onto it. That's how pure and how simple it is. No preservatives, colorants, additives, or anything. Just dried leaves. I couldn't help taking a photograph. When I was in India, I thought it was in another planet, especially in 1979. And I couldn't believe that nearly all the machinery was made in the Sirocco works in Belfast. It made me very, very proud. Sam Davidson definitely is a legend, and I'm surprised if there's, that there's not more made of, of, of uh, this terrific inventor who literally made most of the world's uh, 
T manufacturing equipment, even in Kenya, not just India. Um, tea tasters around the world do it just like David and I do. We use these small cups and saucers and brew tea for three minutes, sorry, two minutes, three grams for two minutes, and then we uh, siphon off the infusion. And that's the way it's done in Calcutta. That's the way it's done in Belfast. There's David and I trying to look studious and intelligent. Um, same the world over. And in our company, there has never been anyone but a Thompson in 170 years that has been um, entrusted with, with buying one tea leaf. Rather unusual claim. Sounds very untrustworthy of, of us, doesn't it? No, we're, we're just fanatics about quality. And quality is an easy word to say. It's, it, to be good quality, you really have to be convinced of its merits and spend a lot more in your tea leaves. We bid every week in auctions in Calcutta and every Tuesday in Mombasa against all other leading tea brands in the world. And if you want Rukareri or a Menti or a Juni or a Kumbi or a Manunga, um, you know, these are Oweru, these are great, great gardens. Everyone in the world agrees with David and I, so you've got to pay a little bit more. That's the only way you secure good teas. This is just a quick example of what good tea should look like. It should look dark and even, that's pure leaf. The tea above is a, I won't mention the brand, it's a leading English brand, but it's, we rip open everyone's tea bags, very sad. Uh, it is, contains quite a lot of stalk and fibre, which is just simply the stem that you pick when you pick the tea leaves. It doesn't do you any harm, it just is a, it's a way of saving money, and it shouldn't be there. A clean blend should look like this. And the one on the bottom left-hand corner is just a very cheap tea, it's full of stalk and fibre, happens to be grown in Iran and Argentina, which I'm afraid do not make good quality tea. So if you're ever offered a cup of that tea, turn, even if you're very thirsty, just say no. Um, it is actually the cheapest thing we consume after tap water, so I think, I think we can all afford a, a good tea. This is where we blend it and pack it. This is, um, this is not our first factory. This is our more re We call it our new factory, although it's 17 years old. Uh, we were originally uh, bombed out of our factory with a, a 300 pound bomb, no less, which destroyed our factory, and I must uh, say it was uh, meant for the police station next door in Musgrave Street, but it didn't console my father and uncle, who almost, uh, their business was almost destroyed. But we rose from the ashes, and this is a very modern um, factory, uh, certified to within an inch of its life. Uh, um, so it's a wonderful place. Uh, our operations manager is due all the thanks for that. It's a BRC grade A factory. Um, this is one of our production lines. Um, these, this machine here is a three-part machine. It produces two and a half thousand bags a minute, actually, uh, the fastest tea bag machine in the world. And every pack we produce, no matter what we produce, is recorded to the minute, and all teas in that pack are traceable. Every tea in every garden is traceable to the very garden. Our warehouse used to be full of uh, tea chests um, in the good old days, but now, because it, they use too, too much timber, we use uh, uh, tea is packed in these multiply uh, paper sacks with foil lining to keep the tea fresh. Not quite so dramatic and so romantic looking, but it uses a lot, lot less timber, and, and that's important. I just don't know what people are doing to move house because we gave away 30,000 chests a year. They were queued up every day of our lives, so I, don't, I hope we haven't uh, been responsible for the downturn in the housing industry and the housing market. Um, a few years ago, we made a big investment. We, this is a tea of a different size and a different shape. Uh, it's a foil pouch. It researched very well. It replaced our cardboard packet. Presentation is very important. We're passionate about quality, about tea leaves, David and I. But presentation is also very important, and uh, research showed us that people valued the fact that we were a fa family company but didn't know that. So we started to introduce this Thompson Family Tea's name uh, to the pack um, with my father and uh, myself on the front uh, to reassure people that this was a, a family company of long standing. Just recently, we've gone a stage further and made it quite a big step in, putting, in elevating the Thompson's name. Um, our hero brand, Panjana, I think will still be the best-selling uh, tea we have, and I hope so for a long time. But it gave us the opportunity to tell people, even in Northern Ireland, who, to our surprise, we didn't realise um, most people think we're from England or from India or from somewhere else. So we were clearly uh, missing a trick there, and we're determined to now start to tell the story about Thompson Family Teas. Um, it enables us to bring out other lines like Irish Breakfast, originally only intended for the east coast of America where it's stocked in some 500 shops. 
and where very enthusiastic Americans are emailing us regularly to tell us how much they like our tea. So whenever we're feeling down, we just flick up one of those emails. We get no compliments at all from Northern Ireland. We've been here too long, <laughs> and it's <laughs> clearly hard to be a prophet in your hometown. But our friendly Americans are over the top about most things, and thankfully about our Irish breakfast. Um, we also brought in a, a, a pack with the centenary of the Titanic. We put a lot of effort into the design and into the quality of this product, and it gave us an opportunity in the back of the pack to talk about my grandfather, his blending facility down in the harbour. He was able to, to see Titanic been built. Many of the workers will have consumed teas from his, um, from his factory. So the provenance was there, and we were delighted with, uh, with this pack, and we were yeah, even more delighted, um, if I could get it to move on, um, to win three gold stars in this year's Great Taste Awards. I can't tell you how happy that made David and I, no, but we weren't cool at all about it. And also won a, a, an award in the in a, a Bloss and Aaron, I think that's how you pronounce it, awards in the Republic of Ireland, which is also, looks actually like an iceberg, that, doesn't it, that trophy? Um, so there are, of course, many different, th these are mainstream teas. There are many other different types of teas, uh, although mainstream tea does account for about 80%. Um, of all tea consumed. Nonetheless, people like to try Earl Grey, um, uh, flavoured with uh, oil of bergamot, as you know, and uh, green tea, unfermented green teas, Darjeeling, Lapsang, Shushong, smoked over uh, cedar chips. I don't know why they do that, but if you like it, it's good. And of course, there are many fruit and herbal alternatives. Things like peppermint tea, not really tea. If it's not from a camellia, I forgot to mention that earlier, a tea bush is a camellia. You, many of you will know the camellia uh, shrub. And which would grow into a tree, actually, if you let it. Camellia sinensis is a tea bush. We have many planted around our, our Panjana tea factory for that very reason. Camellia sinensis. If it's not Camellia sinensis, it's not really tea. And whether you grow it in China or Sri Lanka or India, Kenya, wherever, it's Camellia sinensis. So people call peppermint tea tea. It's not. It's pure peppermint. Chamomile tea is not. It's chamomile, the pollen heads of the chamomile daisy, and so on and so forth. There's... Um, Rubos tea, redbush, which is a herb grown in South Africa. Many alternatives, um, and we have tried to address that in our offering of our string and tag range, which is a recent offering which we're currently actually redesigning with the new Thompson Family Teas uh, name. We're doing this as we speak, but we have also Earl Grey and um, green tea and, and fair trade alternatives there, many of those which have also won great uh, taste awards. Almost everything we've produced, I'm delighted to say, has won a great taste award. We first entered them about five years ago, and um, really don't regret that at all. It's been a great way for us to communicate our quality to many different parties, and to convince ourselves that, because everything we blend in our, in our tea factory, every product we will blend has done so in Belfast with Northern Ireland water, which is soft water. And the awards we won are carried out, or blind tastings carried out in England, which can be soft water and mostly hard water, actually, hard water areas. So winning these gold awards in, in England through these blinds, it was a great thrill for us. It gave David and I quite a lot of confidence as well and reassurance that we were on the right track and uh, were responding well to the, to, to the palate of tea drinkers in, in this part of the world. The, the, our biggest seller, uh, uh, Panjana, uh, won actually more gold stars in this last five years than any other blend, blended, uh, blended tea bag in, in these islands. And that gave us a really a, a huge thrill. Um, so I think that's the, the end of my chat. Uh, Louise um, collated these uh, slides and she said that's a rather boastful one to end on. So I agreed with that. So we're going we're to end with this one, which is our brand new mug just arrived in. And it's an, our take on don't, uh, keep calm and carry on. I don't know whether you can read it, but obviously it's don't panic, just pick Panjana. So on that uplifting note, um, I think I should end. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
in um, County Antrim. Um, for anybody who hasn't been to Glenorm Estate, I would encourage you to go. It's absolutely beautiful. A very, uh, very picturesque, tranquil glen. And not only can you see the cattle grazing, um, but you can also look out over the sea and see the um, salmon, salmon uh, farm. Um, so I'll pass over now to Adrian to tell you the story of Glenorm Estate. Thank you, Michelle. Now, um, you've had the food bit, now you're going to get the culture bit. <laughs> when Michelle uh, rang me up and asked me if I'd say a few words today, um, I said that would be great. Yes, I'd be happy to do so. And then uh, about an hour later, I discovered it was, uh, as we call in Glenarm, the other side of Belfast, uh, North Down. Uh, we had to have a chat about uh, my presentation so a unanimous decision was taken within uh, my office that they would do a video because probably nobody would understand the word I was saying up here. <laughs> so uh, you'll, you'll have to bear with me. So I was outvoted, so I've got a video presentation with me today. And uh, I can just stand here and, and let you see it. But I will try and say uh, something after that for you. Uh, Technology is not a strong point. Right click. Here we go. <laughs> There you have it. Thank you very much. <laughs> There's one thing I can't understand there. I don't know how the hell that horse got in the middle of my beef presentation there. <laughs> Must have been a about the <laughs> cheap software I assume they're using back at Glenarm. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, I was intrigued by the last speakers uh, uh, about tea there. Uh, I knew absolutely nothing about tea, and he's quite right, I never knew we produced it in Northern Ireland. So uh, that, I learned quite a lot there. But one thing that did, uh, I had a few minutes to think about there, I think uh, we're completely in the wrong business at Glenarm. Uh, so when I go back, we'll be seeing about growing tea. For uh, a 50 minute process here and a 30 minute process there, was uh, it's taken us 50 years to get to, to where we are today. So we're obviously in the wrong business. But it's, it's very interesting. Anyway, uh, as you've seen there, we've been uh, trying to produce uh, beef at Glenarm uh, of a quality 
and uh, it has taken us 10 years to get to this stage. And oddly enough, uh, now we're at, we've reached this stage, we feel it's only the beginning again, and we need to start uh, again. We're at a whole new stage. It took us about 10 years to change our whole ethos, our whole farming uh, practices. We farmed with uh, continental cattle, big Charlie bulls, uh, Belgian blues, loads of muscle, took it off to market, and you just stood there and you took whatever price uh, you wanted to, you would be given. You had no option. Um, our aspirations was born out of, uh, we would have some VIPs at Arm occasionally, and we would try to use our own beef to cut a few costs, as we do up in that part of the country. But we couldn't eat our own beef that we were producing. Couldn't eat it. So it was born out of a, an embarrassment, really, uh, as to what we were doing and a whole rethink. So we decided that uh, we had to try and produce something we could eat. So we decided to farm for flavor. And we got rid of all the continentals and we started on an old traditional breed called Shorthorn. And that was some 10 years ago we embarked on that. And uh, after we had our first uh, animal that went to slaughter, uh, we examined the carcass in conjunction with uh, Peter Hanna. We had met him. And we thought, well, it looks OK. Uh, it's not great. There's not enough of marbling, perhaps, in it for the first time through. We have a lot to do. But once we ate it, uh, we were completely bowled over by the flavour. And we subsequently moved on uh, at a rate. We knew we were going in the right direction. We had the flavour. It's, it's, it's one thing to produce an absolutely good product, but it's another then to get it delivered. There's no point in you doing this fantastic product in your farm if uh, the processor or the next stage of the process isn't in the same frame of mind of your, as yourself. So uh, finding a, a really good uh, processor who had the same aspirations as us was, was crucial. Glenarm wasn't just on the doorstep to a good footfall, so there was no uh, idea of ever even opening a farm shop. We just hadn't got the footfall for that. Uh, we took a visit to uh, an organic farmer, and he had his own butchery shop, and he had uh, visitors come to buy his beef in his yard. And he was very good. He showed us all around. He'd done a fantastic job. And then he took us into his butchery, and he, he offered us very kindly a piece of beef to take home. And uh, when he turned around with the two big steaks in his hands, the tears were stripping him. And uh, we were a bit embarrassed by it. And, we said, you know, are you all right? Thought he broke up with the wife or something. And uh, he says, you know, boys, you've been very kind. You've been very kind words today. But he says, I have to tell you something. I am the saddest farmer uh, in these parts. And we said, why was that? And he says, I've had to employ people to come and do my farm work. And I spend more time in the butchery aspect now, cutting up beef in a coal store, uh, freezing. It's not what I want to do. I was born to farm. And he just was dying to get back out again, but he'd spent so much money invested in the butchery aspect, uh, he had to stay in there. And when he would go around on a Sunday afternoon, noon around his stock, he would see things that would upset him. So that was a very valuable lesson the whole way home. Uh, the farm manager, myself, uh, we didn't speak a word all the way back through Belfast. And we were coming near to Lenar, and we looked at each other, and I, we said, Let's not become processors or butchers. We'll just do what we know we can do, and we'll do it well. We want to both stay at farming. So that's what we did. So we teamed up with Peter Hanna, and Peter took us to the next level then. He installed a salt chamber. He took the product to the uh, Good Food Awards and got two stars from them. Uh, the product has just went from strength to strength. Uh, he's just secured um, a deal with Fortland & Masons for Glenarm Organics um, Beef. So it's done very well. The problem we have now is we need more. So we're trying to encourage other farmers right across Northern Ireland to become part of Glenarm Shorthorn Beef, producing the animals to our uh, set standards. And uh, to date, we've got 35 other farmers across Northern Ireland producing uh, Glenarm uh, Shorthorn, both organic and non-organic. So if you know anybody that wants to join, let me know. Um, the power of the product, I can tell you a wee story. We took over uh, Glenarm uh, Organic Salmon in 2007. Uh, at that time when we did that, uh, the salmon knew more about uh, me than I knew about salmon fishing or salmon farming. 
and uh, we inherited this wonderful product. We knew the product was really, really good. We'd heard all sorts of stories from chefs or, uh, around London and so forth, and people who would come to Lanarm. But here we were, uh, we had this uh, product, wonderful as it was, and uh, I say I knew absolutely nothing about it. And uh, all sorts of skeletons was dropping out of the cupboards here, there, and everywhere. But the phone rang about two weeks later, and this uh, very posh gentleman from London uh, said, uh, I hear all about your, your wonderful salmon up there at Lenarm. I was wondering if you'd be kind enough to bring us over some samples. And he was a, a very large uh, fish uh, buyer for the top quality restaurants in London. So of course I says, I oh, know, no problem, I'm your man, you know, I'll, I'll get there. <laughs> and we made an arrangement and uh, we, 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 and Vest NA, I rang them up and they said, oh, we, we'll, we'll give you on, you know, I'll take one of my men, I'll go with you and we'll take you over there. So anyway, uh, we, everything was all a bit rushed, uh, the appointment was made and uh, I made the mistake of just uh, phoning the uh, fish farm manager on the ground at that time and I asked him to put half a dozen fish into a box and uh, make sure they were posted to this person in London and we would pack up the fish when we arrived there. So anyway, the person from Invest and I myself arrived in the car park in London a week later, and uh, to my amazement, the parceled up fish just arrived uh, at the very same time as we did. So we got the box from the uh, parcel van, we were trailing it across the car park in this massive big glass building, it was the biggest glass building I've ever saw in my life in the heart of London. And, uh, to the door came the managing director, he saw us uh, wrestling with the fish, and he came down. And he says, oh, welcome, boys, come on in. He took us in, and uh, the whole way up on the left, there was slime from the fish uh, coming out of the box. And the guy from Invest then, he said to me, should that be coming out of that box? And uh, <clears throat> at that point, I began to slightly worry because I hadn't seen the contents of the box myself. We arrived uh, to the top floor of this uh, glass building to find six uh, chefs standing waiting on the fish arriving. They took it in, set it up on a big counter, and uh, the guy from Invest and I and myself, I uh, thought it would be a good idea to slide away from the box <laughs> because I was really worried about the, uh, you know, what, I was beginning to think uh, there was something just quite not right. So I made my way back from the box a bit, and uh, the investor and I man came with me. <laughs> and uh, he, he was under some pressure as well. He, he could feel there was something just not quite right. <laughs> and there they were, they took the lid of this box, and there was absolute silence. You could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> and six of the top London chefs was all standing looking into this uh, polystyrene box, and nobody spoke for about three minutes. And the sweat just burst on me at that stage. <laughs> and I knew right away uh, there was a problem. And the Invest NA man said to me at that point, did you see the fish before they went in the box? And I says, no, I just rang the guy up and told him he put half a dozen fish in a box. Now occasionally, and it's very occasionally, uh, there's a, some things can happen where there are, there are big birds up at Glenarm and they can swoop into the cage and they can take a bite out of the top of a salmon's head. So I had this vision of the, the six fish that was in the box was all headless, they'd all been bit with this uh, diving uh, fish-eating duck. And uh, so I couldn't take the pressure any longer and uh, I, I spoke up and I says to the managing director, I says, I'm, uh, excuse me, I says, I'm awfully sorry. I says, there's obviously a problem with the fish. Uh, if you just put the lid in the box, we'll find our own way home again. <laughs> and uh, I apologized profusely for what they had seen. And at that point, the managing director turned around and looked at his chefs, and the chefs looked at the managing director again, and uh, my knees get weaker and weaker and weaker. I thought I was going to hit the floor at any stage. And they looked around and says, what do you mean you're going home? Well, I says, there's obviously something wrong with the fish, you know, and I didn't see them. The boy just been told the whole story in the box. And he says, uh, man, what we're going to, this is the best salmon we've ever saw in our lives. <laughs> it's completely, looks like a wild fish, it tastes like a wild fish, it is amazing. This is the king of organic salmon. So it was the opposite way around. So of course I perked up very quickly. <laughs> 
at that stage, and there was a fantastic sigh of relief. And uh, he took us down to the boardroom and put my feet up and asked me would I like a glass of whiskey. <laughs> and uh, he was, uh, if anything, he nearly got over friendly. But the <laughs> that's why I didn't mention his name. But, uh, <laughs> but the, <laughs> the, point, the point of the story, what I'm trying to make is, if you have a, an amazing product, something unique that's different, you've got to have that. The power that that product has out there, the demand for it is just absolutely unbelievable. Now they're shipping uh, salmon to Dubai, China, 62 different countries around the world. They're fighting for it, uh, you know, and the problem now is we can't get it back into Northern Ireland again. Uh, and the beef is heading towards the same direction. They're fighting for it in London. It's a great place to be. It's, it's an absolutely fantastic uh, possession to be in. But uh, as I say, for us, our journey and our beef is really only beginning now. After 10 years, and we're learning every day. Uh, but that's the power a good product ha has. The demand for it is just unbelievable. So thank you very much. And if anybody wants to speak to me later on, I'm, I'll be here. So thank you. If you, if you want to hear, oh, I've lost my microphone. If you want to hear um, Adrian's uh, rendition of the problems they faced with the Atlantic coming in and putting the salmon out of the nets, um, it's very worthwhile hearing because uh, they've overcome a lot of challenges in Glenarm um, <laughs> because of our lovely natural climate. Um, now I'm going to introduce you to Richard Orr. Um, Richard is a cumber potato farmer. Um, he's the first person who's going to talk to us about uh, product of geographic indication. I have to say that Richard also comes from an absolutely beautiful, uh, stunning spot uh, near County Down. In fact, he assures me that they only grow potatoes in a field where there's a good view. Uh, Richard. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Michelle. It's great to be with you here today at this wonderful event. I'd like to thank Northern Ireland Tourist Board and Food NI for the opportunity to tell you our story. I press the wee green button, yeah. <laughs> I'm here today representing the newly formed group Cumber Early PGI. Technophobe. We were formed in July of last year to build upon the new designation and promote our unique product. The aim of our group is to increase the volume and value of Cumber Earlies by stimulating demand in order to sustain a premium price for the benefit and all, for all in the, the supply chain. We are a strong nucleus of eight growers with two pre-packer processors also represented. At present we grow, we are producing approximately 2,000 tonnes per year on 200 acres. As you can see from the above slide, there is plenty of room to increase production. <clears throat> Recognition alongside some of Europe's most iconic regional food brands, which include feta cheese and the mighty Melton Mowbray pork pie, mean the humble Cumber Spud has now achieved a much more salubrious position amongst its peers. Only potatoes grown Planted, grown and harvested within this geograph designated geographical area can be marketed as Cumber Earlies. It's also important to say at this point that only potatoes harvested in May, June or July are eligible for the status. Cumber Earlies will not only be recognised by the correct description and having the appropriate PGI symbol, but every box or bag of potatoes should be marked with a plant health identification number. This ensures this is issued by DARD and is specific to each individual farm, ensuring each batch can be traced back to the farm where it has been produced. Ardsborough Council, specifically Environmental Health, will be responsible for, for policing this protocol. These measures should greatly reduce the instances of spurious copies reaching the consumer. As we were officially formed at the beginning of the first close period, it, uh, uh, our focus to date has been threefold. Firstly, to educate retailers, the hotel and catering trade, consumers and the general public as to the significance of PGI status and what it means for them. 
With today's modern world of globalisation, where our planet has become a very small place and produce can easily be grown thousands of miles from where it is eventually eaten, we have a much more local, safe, nutritious and healthy product, which we can all enjoy knowing it has been grown responsibly in harmony with nature, the environment and to the highest possible standards. It may even be possible for many in the coming months to see Cumber Earlies planted in local fields and watch their progress throughout the growing season through flowering until finally they are harvested in the early summer months. Secondly, we want to promote recognition of the PGI symbol. With only three products having achieved PGI status to date, local products having received PGI status to date, are my Bramley apples, Loch Nails and ourselves, it was very important to promote this symbol and increase awareness. Any product that describes itself as one of these brands must have this symbol clearly marked on it. This is what verifies its authenticity. Thirdly, on the bottom. Thirdly, to highlight the unique qualities of Cumber Earlies and how our local geographical factors of soil, climate and topography influence one another and act together to create these qualities in the first place. With all of that in mind, I have managed to find myself stood up here. <laughs> the Cumber area has been synonymous with growing potatoes for many centuries and is intertwined with the history of two Ulster Scott families, the Hamiltons and the Montgomerys. Indeed, there are still Hamiltons growing at Cumber Earlies to this day. Apparently one of the first literary references to potatoes in Ireland can be found in the Montgomery Manuscripts dating from 1606. This refers to land in Cumber being given over for potato production. And within our own group of farmers, there are families who have been growing potatoes in their land around Cumber for up to six generations. Surely this demonstrates the real pedigree of tradition and heritage which our brand has. Cumber Earlies are characterised and valued by their unique appearance and flavour. Potatoes physically will be small in size, between 30 and 70 millimetres, and they should be round or oval depending on variety. I'd like to take this opportunity to dispel a myth about potatoes. There is no such thing as a potato variety called Cumber. The mention of the area only refers to the place of origin of the potato or where it has been grown. Therefore, the, dif the different shapes of round or oval may only be attributed to a difference in variety. <coughs> Traditional varieties such as Home Guard and Dunluce, along with newer varieties like Accord and Casablanca, are common Cumber early options. Potatoes should also have their characteristic soft and smooth, thin, loose skin. This will indicate that the potatoes have been harvested while their foliage was dark green and still growing. Normal every everyday potatoes such as those available at this time of the year have all been desiccated or their foliage burned off up to three weeks prior to harvest. This allows their skin to harden and set um, and means they're much less susceptible to mechanical damage during harvesting or, or post-harvest spoilage. Cumber earlies, on the other hand, are harvested while their foliage is still green and their skin has not yet set. This means they must be harvested much more slowly and carefully than others. It is then vital that cumber earlies are delivered to their point of use very promptly after harvest. Ideally a lag time of no more than 24 hours from field to fork, or in your case today from drills to dish, is best practice. This will preserve their distinctive earthy, sweet and nutty flavour accompanied with a freshness you can really taste. So what inspires all of this locally? Precisely it is the soil and climate of our area that allows us to grow this unique potato, not forgetting our farmers. The area is dominated by Strangford Loch, the largest inlet in the British Isles. Most of the region is low-lying and the loch has a powerful moderating effect on winter weather. Parental soil is Triassic sandstone and gravel, meaning the soil is lighter and free-draining. Consequently, it dries out more rapidly in winter and warms up more quickly in summer. Protection offered by the Arge Peninsula to the east and the Mourne Mountains to the south, along with the south-east location, mean that the microclimate of the designated area is both warmer and drier than other parts of Northern Ireland. The area receives the greatest amount of sunshine, hard to believe, with around 1,500 hours per year and has the longest main growing season of, the pro of any part of the province with over 270 days. 
Therefore, it's easy to see how these unique characteristics work together to produce fantastic spuds. So what about our farmers? If you come down to our farm, to, to the McKees, the Gillilands or any other Cumber early producer for that matter, you'll meet farmers who take enormous care and pride in what they do, using age-old husbandry techniques to ensure potatoes are ready as early as possible. <clears throat> Seedlings have already been placed in plastic or wooden trays and placed in rows throughout a barn or a shed not unlike this. This allows air and light to circulate around the potatoes, ensuring a, a short, stiff sprout this is the first growth of the new season. Uh, then, through careful, fe careful field selection, through soil testing and analysis, with trace elms, dressings, and nutrient applications made accordingly. Rigorous soil preparation, which includes the removal of all stones and clods from the soil, leaving only a fine, earthy tilth in which the sprouted seeds are planted. This means that uh, then at harvesting there are less foreign objects, i.e. stones, etc., to, to damage the potato when being lifted. <coughs> Farmers will then work throughout the season to methodically manage their crop, depending on weather or disease and different things that become a problem. And then potatoes are harvested daily to ensure their freshness. In summary, this allows our potatoes to be planted earlier, grow quicker, mature faster, be harvested first, and ultimately taste better than any others. And I have no bias, of course. It's a nice bowl of steamed cumber earlies. So what next? Cumber earlies, well, firstly, I'd like to say there's a lot of people here today if you'd like to tell all your family and friends about the Cumber Early and our, our unique status. Um, also, Cumber Early's PGI website will launch on the 1st of March this year. Um, myself and hopefully some others will be going out visiting local schools uh, and informing children of where spuds come from, what they are, our unique status here, um, and various other aspects of potato growing. Um, the first ever Cumber Potato Festival is to be held on the 22nd of June 2013. This has been or organised by Ardsborough Council. And uh, it was such a big year for Northern Ireland tourism, with uh, Derry Stroke London Derry being the city of culture, um, the G8 in the, the Loch Erne, and the, the, the World Police and Fire Games, which Michelle has already mentioned. Uh, we'll be working with other councils to see what we can do for them. There will be PR events road shows along with some competitions and we'll be using the website to promote anyone who's using our Cumber Earlies on their, on their menus. We're getting very excited for the start of the new season on the 1st of May, however, with the snow lying outside, <clears throat> you'll forgive us possibly, we might be 10 days late. So thank you very much for listening to me today and uh, hopefully you can work together in the future to build upon the legacy and success of the Cumber Early. Thank you. Thanks very much to Richard. I remember ringing one of the uh, Cumber potato farmers last year and asking him how would be the, what would be the best way to demonstrate Cumber potatoes um, at a, actually I think it was a Balmoral show, and he said to me, just fry a wee bit of bacon in the pan, put in a bit of cabbage. <laughs> and put in your cumber potatoes. He says, oh, excuse me. He says, I'm going to have to go home for my lunch. I've made myself hungry. But um, there is a theory, of course, amongst uh, historians that actually the Ulster Scots took um, potatoes back out to America. And um, in fact, if anybody goes out to um, around the Appalachians, you'll find that there's still some imaginative ways where uh, they cook potatoes. Um, and there's a, we have a chef up in uh, Derry Stoke Lunton Derry, who's convinced that Northern Ireland uh, immigrants to America were responsible for hash browns. But certainly I can say that um, certainly in those sorts of regions, they also uh, still cook with things like buttermilk, which is quite unique to our kind of food culture. Um, our final food hero is Will Taylor of Glastry Farm. And I remember Will uh, having, a, having a talking five years ago about his vision and having this dream that he was going to produce a real dairy ice cream on his farm 
And I have to say, a couple of times I've rung Will up uh, to complain about my daily woes, and he said, don't worry, Michelle, I have the solution to all of life's problems. Just go to the garage in Ballygown and get some of our double chocolate ice cream, and you'll be OK. So could I just introduce Will Taylor of Glastry Farm? Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation uh, uh, from our host today uh, to this salubrious surroundings. David's not in the, in the room at the moment. It is truly amazing. This is my first visit and uh, well done. Uh, it is really a, a, a first class tourist destination. Unlike the young things, ladies and gentlemen, that preceded me, uh, I'm of a vintage of Jonathan Swift and Hans Sloan, uh, they, they needed the uh, video and uh, PowerPoint presentations uh, for visual effect. I need them at my age for prompts and uh, it's even worse than that. Uh, if you can't see the prompts and you need glasses, then uh, it's doubly difficult. Will Taylor, we farm on the wild windswept barren land called the Ards Peninsula which protects the designated area and uh, we've been there as a Taylor family since 1856. There's a thread running through all these presentations, family run, attention to detail. The sixth generation is already in place and he's all, th all things uh, dairying and dairy farm, Gareth. Uh, son Gareth. Uh, probably one of the uh, melting points in terms of my career, uh, I've done two Nuffields was, uh, scholarships, uh, was in 2004 when we looked at uh, Europe and in particular the new accession countries, Eastern Europe, and came away with the, what we are talking about today in the last half hour, three quarters of an hour. So many PGI, uh, potential PGI at that point, uh, designated area products that Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary and so on were putting forward and I had to report from uh, an EU member state at that point, we had none. How sad. So congratulations to all concerned that we're now breaking the mould. And in our business, uh, we moved from being a, a, a commodity producer like uh, Glenarm Castle, uh, taking whatever we could get for our, our product, our raw material, in this case milk, uh, to in 206-7 to being a customer-led uh, business that was consumer-orientated. And we have now, in the last six years, matured to the point uh, where we have our production manager, who is sweating away today, ladies and gentlemen, through a bit of a bad dairying on my point, and she's doing our salsa BRC at the moment. Probably I'm better here. At the moment, we have something like uh, 250 pedigree dairy herds. Uh, we have a whole list of accolades. UK Farm of the Year, Northern Ireland Dairy Farm of the Year, Focus Farm, uh, and so on and so forth. Ladies and gentlemen, could I make a confession to you? When we received this, these sort of accolades, it really massaged the ego tremendously. Uh, you came home that evening on a high, you wakened up the next morning, and it didn't make one blind bit of difference to down here. There was no extra money in the, in, in the business. And yet, by acknowledgement from our peers, we were producing probably in the top 1% of uh, excellence in terms of our raw materials, whether you measured it from a bacteriological point of view, whether you measured it from a compositional point of view, but it didn't make one blind bit of difference. So we made the big decision after uh, the Nuffield Scholarship that we were going to move a step forward in terms of 
what we've done and how we've done it. Something similar to what Adrian has so eloquently uh, said happened at Glenarm Castle. So in 2006, we done our market research. Oh boy, that market research was so accurate then that it is almost unbelievable. I opened it up every now and again uh, to look at it. It said that consumers were prepared to pay a small premium, a small premium for regional food. R food that was identified as regional. In other words, regional flavors, bringing out the real advantages that we have in terms of our maritime temperate climate here in the island of Ireland. They were prepared to pay a small premium for healthy food. That's the other catch, healthy food, natural food, possibly organic, but certainly natural. So we move from that market research to commissioning the Food and Technology Centre at Lochray to bring forward a list of products and flavours that would encompass what we found from our market research. And I can do nothing but give praise for that facility. We are sitting on a gold mine, and so often we don't appreciate it, what, what we have to back up the success stories that you have heard about uh, earlier today. So, Farm Fresh Ice Cream, Glastry Farm, Okay, we've had another list of accolades. We won the Food and Drink Awards Small Company in 2011. Uh, we have had our Kilbegan Whiskey Ice Cream in conjunction with Kilbegan County Westmeath, another regional flavour. Uh, has won, uh, it was the winner of that award and has subsequently went on to win Great Taste Awards. We're the Irish Speciality Food Company at 212. That's taking in competition from all over the island. So what do we do? We produce luxury dairy ice creams fresh from the farm. And make no mistake about it, ladies and gentlemen, as you move out into that intense marketplace, there is tremendous pressure, almost intolerable pleasure, pressure to hand away that premium, to produce something that is a little bit less than the standard of excellence that we aspired to in, at the beginning of 2007. We have all seen in the last 10 days where that eventually takes you and a 10 million uh, product recall. We have EU uh, approved food premises State-of-the-art equipment, well, if you're in ice cream, it's Italian. Uh, our training and development has all been done and continues to be done at Food Technology Centre. Freezer van distribution, but more and more, like Glenarm Estate, we're moving into food distribution and we do what's best, produce the goods. So, uh, okay, I'll not mention any names, but we now have distribution throughout the island of Ireland. Our design people have uh, commissioned packaging, so important in food retail and increasingly important in the wholesale food service. And of course, our products are barcoded. What's the sort of flavors that Lockery brought forward these regional flavours, yellow man, yeah, honeycomb. A lot of people produce honeycomb ice cream. We produce the real thing from the Owl Lamisphere in Ballycastle. And the people who produce it guard their recipe uh, with, with almost uh, their own right arm. So in terms of trading standards, it was pretty difficult to get a full declaration. Kilbegan Whiskey, I've already mentioned, from uh, uh, County Westmeath. We produce Bramley Apple ice cream. Uh, we produce rhubarb and custard. Combine it with custard. Grows in your own garden. Strawberries in our own garden. We use homegrown fruit and real fruit, not purees, not flavours uh, in, in, in our range of, of flavours. And 
We're moving very, very rapidly along this line of uh, healthy eating. Lockery have once again brought forward, uh, initially it was a pear sorbet. No dairy, no inclusion of dairying. Suddenly our 250 lady, ladies have uh, uh, an, an almost, uh, well, reluctant P45s heading their way if uh, sorbets really continue to grow in terms of the growth that uh, we achieved in 2012. What are we doing? Well, we have the regional flavours, as I have said. The healthy eating thing continues uh, at Glastry Farm in conjunction with Clandy Boy Yogurt. Uh, Lockery have now developed a yogurt dessert ice cream. We firmly believe that it's probably the first real uh, yogurt flavored ice cream uh, in, on the marketplace at the moment. Uh, the final product is in place. We're just doing the technicalities, the sensory analysis, the writing up the spec for trading standards, HACCPs and so on. Uh, we would certainly hope that that will be introduced initially into food service uh, in around Easter time and hopefully retail later in the year. The, se the second or third uh, part of the innovation process, because it's so important, even though you're small, uh, to keep ahead of the pack, uh, we produce what is known as a Neapolitan. Anyone remember sliders? There's a few older ones nod their head in the audience. Uh, well, we have produced a slider. Uh, at the moment, it's, uh, it's uh, uniquely available in the Hastings Hotel Group. Uh, it's been a real success story. Uh, a combination of three flavors, and uh, it has been their signature dish for the last 10 months or so. We produce ice, ice cream cakes, an example you can see here, uh, for anniversary special occasions. But, ladies and gentlemen, the real success story of our innovation strategy, certainly in the last 12 months, has been Glastry Farm sorbets. We have now branched out. Not only do we produce pear sorbet in both food service and retail, but in food service, an apple snaps, that's a little dash of Jack Daniels, raspberry, champagne, and black currant. And the growth in, in those sorbet uh, volumes uh, and sales, has, it's about 300% in year 12. So we're back again to almost the same slide as our other, our other food heroes have illustrated. We can claim so many things, and I am guilty like anyone else, but the real test is to have it independently appraised. When you talk about excellence, there's only, it has to be independent. And we believe that we're probably the only manufacturer of, certainly in the dairy sector, who has pasture to product uh, control. We have, we're red tractor assured on our dairy farm and we're salsa BRC, hopefully from today again uh, on, on the ice cream plant. We have a farming family that is committed and adapting to a consumer focus. We already have in, uh, some uh, we have ensured succession in that, as I've said, son Gareth is now all things farm. Daughter Grace, the accountant, uh, looks after the finances, particularly of uh, Glastry Farm ice cream. She appears every now and again with spreadsheets and uh, parks them in front of me and says, look, Dad, you have spent so much money on such and such a flavor in terms of product development. Look, this sales don't match up. And there's only one thing that dad can do, he falls asleep because there's no answer to a countenance. <laughs> Secondly, we enjoy the challenge and that really makes the difference in terms of going forward. 
The measure of success is always, as everyone uh, that has stood up here for the last uh, three quarters of an hour has claimed, independent analysis and appraisal. And I leave you there. Thank you very much.